Uh, thank you for joining us. Can everyone hear me? My name is Chris Mountner. Thank you for joining us for Libraries and Comics, Past, Present, and Future Trends. I'll be your moderator du jour for the moment. Um, I'm really excited to um, moderate this panel today because I feel like libraries have played such a huge role in developing and changing the comics industry and the, our attitudes towards comics. And I'm hoping we can really dive into that today. Um, and I have a, four really, really talented people and amazing people here. Um, so going down from my right, I'm going to introduce everybody. Uh, first off is Kathy Schalk Green of the, um, I'm sorry, from my left. <laughs> I can do, I, uh, from the far right is Kathy Schalk Green of the American Library Association. Yay! <laughs> moving down, moving down back towards me is the one and only uh, Raina Telgemeier, award-winning, best-selling author of Smile, Drama, Sisters. <laughs> And her new book, and the, perhaps the largest star in the comics for a minute. For a minute. Um, next to her is Jack Cohen, Director of Publicity and Promotions at Fanagraphics Books. Oh, you, don't, you don't need to clap for that. And finally, <laughs> to my immediate right, is Megan Hall's Ban of the Library of Congress. So I wanted to, I wanted to kick off by talking about uh, Megan and uh, Kathy. I, I'm, I'm curious um, just generally how close, uh, how affiliated or how familiar you were with comics prior to say 2000, 2002. Because as a, you know, as a kid growing up, I remember going to my local library, looking at the comics, but it would be like New Yorker collections of gag cartoons and nothing else. They were very separate worlds. So as people coming, being in the library sciences, being librarians, like were you aware of kind of what was going on at comics before say, things started to change and libraries started taking more of an interest in comics? I did a little bit of research because that's what librarians do. And it turns out that in the professional literature, uh, the first article I found about graphic novels and comics in libraries was in 1990. So that uh, uh, librarians kind of at their best provide the kind of material and, and reading matter and viewing and listening matter that their communities want. And people want to read comics and graphic novels. So um, we know that libraries were starting to collect uh, those formats uh, early in the 90s and before. And usually it was because there was a champion in that library. It could have been, like when people started, I was thinking, I started as a fangirl. You know, I really liked comics. My husband wooed me with underground feminist comics. Yes. And, uh, and we've been married a long time now. Um, Can you name one of the comics? <laughs> <laughs> Not one of the comics, but the comic collector, definitely. Uh, and uh, so people started out in libraries and librarians were either leaders or followers. They were early, either early adopters of the format in their libraries and championed it, or they followed the trends in publishing. Uh, and as graphic novels and comics became more and more mainstream to be held in library collections, they pounced on that uh, so that it really depended on the library you were at. And it could be, you know, one community next to another could be completely different worlds because of the people who were selecting the materials at that library. Interesting. Megan? So I'll, I'll justify or qualify this statement with I've only been at the Library of Congress for. Uh, 11 years now, so I'm still new at the library. <laughs> um, you know, the library has had, the Library of Congress has had comic book materials since the beginning. Um, we have a number of golden age materials that are stamped with the copyright stamp for, you know, the 1930s and 1940s. But the collection itself has had a sort of varied history where certain um, custodians of the collection felt like it was more important than other custodians. And so it really, the, our, collection, our collection kind of reflects that a little bit. Um, you know, so I think a lot of um, the way that we look at our collection now is in part due to the work of my colleague Georgia Higley, who brought 
um, quite a bit of the material from the general collections into the special collections division that I'm in in the serial and government publications division and did a lot of work to help preserve those, to catalog them, to make them available. Um, most people don't actually think of, they, when you think of a library, you, you would assume graphic novels or comics because that's what people read. Um, but the Library of Congress, we don't often have that image of people thinking that we have one of the largest comic book collections in the world, which we do. Yeah. Um, so uh, 160,000 plus at this point, I think, 8,000 wow. 8, titles-ish growing every year. Um, so, you know, it's, and I came into the library not actually having a background in comics myself. So what I've kind of learned over the course of the last decade is a lot about um, you know, the collection, the history of our collection, but also the history of collecting elsewhere. And um, the library is sort of a, a strange place because we are the de facto national library. So um, we're not officially charged with that mission, but we, we do serve as that record of United States creativity and publishing. Um, we're not, we are a public library, we're open to the public. Anyone over the age of 16 can register for a reader card, but we don't lend our materials to the public. So, um, it's a, we don't necessarily always follow the trends that other libraries do, um, but what I hope and one of my goals working with the collection is that you know we collect things that are important to people now. And so that, and to make sure that the collection moving forward for 50 years from now is a good reflection of what people were reading and what people wanted to see, who was publishing, who was creating now in this time period because, because um, there's a huge diverse um, set of creators who are working now. And I think it's important that we, as the library, because we have so many resources that a lot of other libraries don't, that we do that work. Right. Sorry, that was kind of off, like no, way no, off of a, your question or topic. <laughs> so interesting. I encourage it. Um, well, one of the reasons I asked that question is because it feels very much to me like there was a tipping point at a certain point in the early aughts where suddenly comics, which were, you know, had been traditionally, I mean, there had been a slow build in the underground and the alt scenes. And, and places like SPX in the 90s, but um, there was suddenly like a point where it became an, a sudden awareness. And I'm curious, I know what I think the tipping point is, but I wanna hear kind of what you guys think it might be. And yes, I'm looking at you, Raina, but um, like, I'm curious as to like, where, what, what, what's, what do you think initiated the, you know, because before, you know, the, the traditional, I think the traditional myth or the traditional stereotype was, you know, librarians and teachers being like, oh, go read a real book, you know? <laughs> so what, what brought that change? I think, I, was it just that, just the wealth of material and people telling their own stories? Or was there a book or, or an incident in particular? When was your first book published, Rita? 2006. But it was the Babysitter's Club series, and Smile wasn't published until 2010. So maybe, I don't know. I can't answer that question. <laughs> I think that there is a very obvious shift in um, comics and graphic novels. I guess the term graphic novel really came about in popular culture in um, the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, so a lot more publishers were putting out books with spines, which was probably very helpful for librarians to have them on the shelves. And I mean, we call this generation of young comics readers the Raina Talkmeyer generation because, 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 there was a, because there was a really big shift where you had younger people and younger women and, and girls going into the library who were excited to pick up comics. And, um, and I think that that's, a good starting point for, yeah. for people building collections, especially youth services librarians who needed to build collections to meet the demand of the people that were going in, the kids that were going in and wanted to read books. I think it's, I think it's also helpful to talk about like the manga boom 
that happened in the early aughts and started in the late 90s, and, and those were the books that were bringing kids into bookstores, into libraries, wanting volume after volume, and that hunger for more probably helped to feed um, the North American boom that happened in the early 10s. Is that what we call them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 10 years ago. Um, and I mean, when I was first getting started, what was on the shelf? It was Baby Mouse, it was Lunch Lady, it was um, stuff that was still aimed at a younger kid audience, and then like the gritty adult stuff, and there wasn't that much for the in-between set except for manga. So all of these, all of these things sort of happened in their own um, communities, in their own spaces, and they all sort of smooshed together, and now we're here. Um, I also think, I think, uh Jeff Smith's Bone Absolutely. was sure. really one of the tipping points, not just in terms of audience, but in the fact that Scholastic found mm -hmm. your publisher, Raina, found it and published it. And I think that you have um, with them a major children's publisher that goes into schools with their book clubs and their, and their, uh, and their uh, book order things. Mm -hmm. And that gets the attention, I think, of teachers and librarians who are saying, it oh. Fools them. They go, oh, well, <laughs> In terms of the American Library Association, one of the big things they do is they hold large conferences and thousands of librarians and publishers and people come to take a look at that. And a tipping point there was in 2004, they had a graphic novel pavilion. Now this is not to say that graphic novels were not represented at the conference by individual publishers beforehand, but that was the first time we saw kind of a coalescence of interest around a particular format rather than publisher by publisher uh, um, uh, activity there. And there's been a whole group of librarians within the American Library Association that has continued to bring to the conference things like artists' alleys that allow artists and writers uh, access to librarians uh, at these conferences that are held all over the country. So if you're an artist, you may want to check out the American Library Association website, ALA.org, uh, to see when a conference might be coming to your area. And the people to contact within ALA is the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable, because they're the folks that organize this. They also are the people within ALA now that are kind of like the official home of the Eisner Awards that are giving, the home within ALA. Eisner Grants. Uh, the Eisner Grants, too, yes. And uh, so uh, those are things, if you're creators, to be on the lookout for and make connections with. Isn't there a zine pavilion now in yes, ALA? Yes, yes. So it's yeah. not just an artist alley, there's also a zine pavilion, which is <clears throat> perfect for many people in this room, probably. Yeah. Um, how 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 uh, big a chunk of the sales market is, is the li is the library market? How important in, in financially and in terms of audience and stuff is would you say is, is are the is the library market significant? <laughs> without without giving too many numbers, um, and it's growing. Uh, at least with Fanographics, we recently hired somebody specifically to do um, marketing to libraries, collection development um, librarians. Um, we understand that. These are the people who are, sh the librarians, the people who are sharing um, comics with, uh, directly with people in the community. So it's, it's a significant part of publishing and it's gonna continue to be a significant part of publishing, especially now that so many people are focusing on digital. Us as a publishing house who love ink and paper wanna make sure that um, we have uh, good connections and relationships with our librarians who will always be the archivists of our art form. Raina, for you too, as like as a cartoonist, like how can you do you have an idea of like how important how integral to getting your work out and getting read? It's pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> I mean a lot of kids don't have cash. So when you're talking about a kid audience, like how are kids supposed to get the books into their hands? They either 
borrow it from a friend, or somebody gives them a present, or they read it in the library. And I think the support of the ALA and of school librarians and um, you know just those communities have really seen how excited their kids get and how much kids love reading comics. So um, yeah, I don't. I, I can't extrapolate my own career from <laughs> the importance of libraries, <laughs> except to say that I was self-publishing and then I had libraries on my side. When you're so, when you're working on your next graphic novel or when you're working on a promo <laughs> or when you're working on a, um, um, a pr uh, catalog for Fanta or when you're working on how much are, are you keeping in mind are you keeping in mind the library market and thinking about them without maybe having it necessarily influence in oh there's a lot of influence actually this this coming season we have a book that the whole concept was born out of the graphic novel roundtable breakfast at ALA Midwinter. Uh, I had a, a group of librarians ask me if we were doing comics in um, other languages, especially Spanish. So we weren't, and now we are. So we have a book coming out this fall called The House by Paco Roca that we're also simultaneously releasing um, in Spanish called La Casa. And uh, uh, so our catalog, we are now trying to shape our catalog to specifically cater to the requests of the librarians that we interact with at the ALA um, annual conference. Um, what, are, what were some of the, the initial challenges um, that like uh, librarians or publishers or cartoonists working with librarians, you know, faced in connecting with each other and even getting books on the shelves, developing a library, developing a graphic novel section, which I think for a lot of, um, you know, even anecdotally what you may have heard, because I think in terms of like even smaller libraries or school libraries, getting, creating something, I think my an own anecdotal feeling is that like, people like were kind of like, well, I want this, but I'm really not sure how to go about doing it. I mean, and I'm especially interested because you said you, you know, you were came coming coming into it a little fresh. Mm -hmm. And um, and you so did you feel like you had hurdles to go through or um <laughs> maybe I hurdles is the wrong word. But. Yeah. <laughs> well so every time somebody comes to ask me about the collection, I learn something new. I mean the collection is so big and so broad and deep and the way that the library structures our collections is kind of by format. So I actually specifically only work with um, the comic book books. So like the staple bound floppies, floppies that you get that are serialized in addition to the materials that we get from the Small Press Expo. So my view of the comics and graphic novel scene is actually very narrow, narrow um, to a certain extent because um, all of the graphic novels actually go to the general collections. They're cataloged as books, and it's a very nerdy yes. way of um, <laughs> classifying things, but that's how the library does it. That's how we separated it. Um, graphic novels are books. They have ISBN numbers. They live on the shelf with the other books. Um, they're often cataloged according to their subject. Um, so, you know, a book about um, Peter Bagg's um, book, uh, The Life of the Rose Neil. Zora Neale Hurston. Zorn, or any, either of those would live on the <laughs> shelf with other, you know, um, historical texts about that person. It wouldn't be, like, segregated into, like, the comics section. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of one of the both good and bad things about the Library of Congress is that you can't just necessarily go to a shelf and see all of the graphic novels, but they're integrated, they're part of the library's collection and we kind of assume that people would request them just like they would request any kind of other, um, you know, written material uh, with the, on a particular subject. You know, the, the downside of that is that it's separated from the flappy comics, so it, it takes a little bit to pull that together for right. us. Right, well that's interesting because I remember back in the day like with people like Art Spiegelman when graphic novels were just starting complaining about how their <laughs> mouse would be shelled with, with Batman and, and yeah. Justice League when it should be over under like Holocaust or World War II books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that we've had some um, comments <laughs> from community members of various uh, places around the country where a book that was 
clearly adult material, which is primarily what Fantagraphics publishes is comics and graphic novels for adults, was put in the kids section because it was a comic. Um, so we're still, we're still, we still have some room to grow uh, within the library system. Um, if you don't have your champion, I think is what you were saying, um, at your library who's really familiar with the medium, then they're, you're gonna get some less than appropriate material for young eyes in the wrong section. That's why libraries are awesome. <laughs> 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 you're not supposed to read. <laughs> Welcome to Fanographics. <laughs> totally true. You're well, not some supposed of the, to read. Some of the challenges for libraries uh, were different kind of early on before uh, graphic novels became more mainstream. Mm -hmm. and were regularly reviewed in the kinds of um, journals and magazines that mainstream librarians go to to look for material to, to purchase. So again, the, the importance of the early champion, the early leader for the format, for kind of digging out, uh, that role is still really important, particularly for independently published material. It's easier to find more mainstream comics and graphic novels now, um, but not as easy to find the independently published that may not be reviewed. So, um, you know, one place to look, again, talking to the artists in the room, is the American Library Association has state chapters in every uh, state in the country. And they frequently have panels talking about graphic novels at their own conferences, their state conferences. So connecting with the people in your own local community and state that are interested in graphic novels and comics will help uh, pave the way of getting you into library collections. Uh, things have changed significantly since the middle aughts. Uh, again, I was looking at what kinds of resources are available to librarians, and there are now uh, professional materials talking about collection development of graphic novels collections and uh, recommended titles and resources. So it's much more kind of in people's consciousness now. That's not to say that there isn't still prejudice against the format in individual libraries. It's almost like a library by library battle sometimes. I see that you know one community is all for it and has a tremendous collection and the next community, it's like crickets, you know, so. So it really just depends on if you've got someone cool at the library. Or not. <laughs> you know, uh, many librarians are cool, I'm glad to say. <laughs> but, All librarians are cool, but. But uh, the, the coolness meter varies. Well, that, that, that sounds like a good, that, uh, that's a good segue, actually, because I wanted, did want to ask about issues of censorship and banned books. Um, and Rana, I know you in particular with your book, Drama, um, I, I know sometimes you've posted on social media some of the amusing letters you've gotten um, because of wow. drama specific. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, I know that you've had, it, people have had problems with <laughs> drama because of the LGBT issue, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, drama issues you raise in there. Um, and you've had experience with um, dealing with people who want to censor your books. Yeah. And, and, I do uh, that. and I, I because they're like books for kids and the, the sexually appropriate content that people get upset about is the fact that two boys on stage share kids. Yeah. So um, if you just turn the page, whatever page it is, and you're just like, look at this inflammatory content, but you don't write the story, like, that's not cool. So, so graphic novels offer people the ability to just jump right to a page, take it out of context, and say, this is not okay. Right. This is not appropriate. This is this is too mature or whatever, but if it were a girl and a boy that were sharing the same kiss, nobody would raise an eye. So that sucks. <laughs> well, how, how, do you, how do you deal with it? And do you feel like comics, because they're visual, because it's easier in your, when you're dealing with a prose novel, you have to be descriptive and describe mm -hmm. a scene where they're in a comics, it's right there visually. The power um, of it's the power of that, that's absolutely the power. But like, do you feel that comics get more calls mm -hmm. for censorship or, or banned in libraries? And if so, how, how do you handle that? How do you deal with that sort of thing? 
I mean, yeah, probably the answer is yes, but we deal with it by, you know, Scholastic is a children's book publisher, and so they're not going to publish something that they haven't vetted carefully and have a lot of conversations about who they're selling it to, where they're shelving it. And so beyond that, I mean, the gatekeepers just kind of have to do their jobs too, and if they think, well, this is not something that my kids should be reading, I'm going to place it on a different shelf. But, you know, if they're outright banning it, <coughs> people are complaining about it, it's, it's hard to say like, what to do and how to change it. But as a creator, my job is not to worry about that too much. It's just about telling stories that I think are important to tell. And, you know, I get letters that say, you're pushing an agenda. And I'm like, my agenda is that I write stories about kids and about their friends and about their relationships. And I don't think that's an agenda at all. Nope. Gay kids exist. They, do. <laughs> they sure do. There's actually a comic by uh, Katie upstairs that's called Gay Kid, Katie Omberg. And I collected that in 2011 um, when she first came, they, sorry. Um, and that is one of the things that we are trying to do, especially with the materials that we collect at the Small Press Expo, is to make sure that we have um, basically everybody represented. Um, in the collection, um, the you know libraries and Kathy can speak more to this. Libraries have always had a history of you know um, I don't know what the right phrase that I want to um, not being a um, source of censorship or of um, being a a place that will uh, target you know particular reading lists or what was the I should know this because she's the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, with the Patriot Act. They wanted to um, subpoena library records for people, and the American Library Association was really great about um, not, you know, arguing against that so that people's reading preferences wouldn't be spied on by the government. Wow. Um, Thank you. Yes, intellectual freedom. <laughs> Thank you. I, I should know this. Um, but so, you know, I think one of the challenges for libraries is how do we balance, you know, collecting material that we know that people want to use but also is important to collect because of the subject matter, whether or not it is universally accepted as appropriate. Um, and so, um, you know, I have the luxury of being at an institution where we can universally collect to a certain degree. Um, and so I feel kind of like it's an important job for me as somebody who gets material for the library that we do, I'm not censoring. And in fact, I want a diverse amount of material. I want both kids stuff and adult stuff um, because that's what we have at the Library um, of Congress. We're not, we're making it available for future researchers. We're not, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, deciding who gets to read what. Right. And I wanted to um, uh, talk just a little bit about, uh, in the real world, how libraries handle those kinds of complaints from people. Because I've been on the receiving end of phone calls from angry people upset about one thing or another. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that libraries yank something off the shelf because one person has complained. My experience has been that most people, when they complain, want to be heard. And once they're heard, uh, then, then, and we, they understand that we collect for a diverse audience, they pretty much have settled down with it. If they haven't, which is their right, uh, we do have in libraries things called collection development policies and that go into what happens when somebody uh, challenges a material. And one of the first questions we ask is, have you read the whole thing? Mm. <laughs> and are you willing to fill out this form? And it's amazing how many people stop their complaint <laughs> when asked to follow a process that then goes through an internal review at the library. Uh, some people do, and again, that's their right, but there's a whole kind of 
philosophy and procedure that goes into collecting materials. I used to work for a woman who said, I want something in my library to offend everybody. Yeah, 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 please. Um, I love anecdotes. So, um, Gina Gagliano and Allison Wilgus have a podcast called Graphic Novel TK, where they talk about pretty much every aspect of the graphic novel publishing industry, like librarians and creators and comic book stores and conventions. Um, and Gina's the publisher of Random House. Wait, what is it called? Random House Kids. Kids but, Graphics. Graphic, oh God, graphic Kids. Or something. Sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, they spoke with Robin Brenner, who works at the Brookline Library in Brookline, Massachusetts. And I think of Robin as one of those like graphic novel super librarians. Totally, been, yeah. Like on the ground floor of this movement since the early odds. She's a fan, she's an advocate, she's so many things. Um, and she said that their teen room has books that kids don't check out. They are allowed to take them home and read them and keep them for as long as they want, but they never have to fill out the cards. They never have to record their name. So if you're a kid and you feel like, oh my gosh, if I check this book out, it's gonna go into the system. It's, you know, my parents might find out what I'm reading, as you were talking about earlier. It's like this actually prevents that from happening. And it's all done on faith. So um, they're able to have a collection of books just because they want them there and they don't have to worry about like, Nice. The outside world's opinions, but I think that's super cool. And I don't know if that's something that every library could do. Probably not. But I thought it was really neat. It's a neat model. It's a neat model, yeah. Um, here's a here's a broad paintbrush question. How have yeah I love them. Uh, how have libraries changed comics? How have they changed the way we approach comics? How have they have changed events like SPX, where we're having a panel right now on comics and libraries? I think that. Libraries, change is a big word. Yeah. I would say broadened comics by allowing all different kinds of people to walk in and read without the restrictions of, you know, $30 for a hardcover book or, um, or access because there's not a, a good comic shop in their neighborhood. Um, I mean, most neighborhoods have libraries. So I don't know if change is the word, but maybe evolve mm. and broaden. That's good. Um, well, I want to do actually a shout out. I don't know that it's necessarily answering your question, mm -hmm. but on the inside cover of your SPX program, uh, they talk about, it's like page three, uh, the graphic novel gift program. It's more of like how um, has uh, have comics institutions like SPX and others uh, been embraced libraries. Uh, they have a program where they collect graphic novels and gift those to different libraries over time. They also acknowledge inside the program the relationship between SPX and the Library of Congress. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Warren Bernard and the Executive Committee uh, for embracing librarians and libraries uh, for the 25th anniversary. They made uh, access to librarians free to the show. And a question I've been dying to ask <laughs> is, how many librarians are there in the audience today? Oh. Yeah. Um, something, something that I'd like to, um, I don't know, I guess give a shout out to is, Raina was at the National Book Festival, which is now in its 19th year. 19th year? Yeah. Um, on the main stage at the Library's National Book Festival this year. And so um, previously, the, the library has had a graphic novel pavilion. Um, we now have integrated graphic novels into all of the genre stages across the National Book Festival. And so um, I think that that kind of, um, the library is certainly not at the vanguard of this, mm -hmm. um, but I think that kind of speaks to um, how the, the forum is sort of looked at from a broader perspective is that, um, you know, Raina was on the main stage. That was 4,000 seats, I think, and it was 
full. <laughs> so um, obviously, so you know the, and that work is in part a large largely due to my colleague Sarah Duke, who's been in charge of this and bringing graphic novels to the library, uh, to the National Book Festival. Um, and she's worked very hard with that, and it's also in due in part to Warren's work as well with us. Um, but, you know, I think the, well, let me rephrase that. I hope that, um, you know, libraries can be a part of, you know, um, saying to larger publishers even, we want more, diverse stories, we want more um, diverse creators, we want, the, we want our voices represented in your publishing. And so in that way to kind of champion some of the, the creators who are here who are maybe self-publishing, but then in five years might be, you know, DC's next superstar artist or Fanographics next superstar artist. Yeah, that's the way to go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, who was the first publisher you mentioned? I, I, I bet. Small, really small time. Small publisher. Uh, I wanted to ask, is, is it fair to say, because I think when a lot of people think about libraries and comics, they tend to think young YA audience or our children's audience. Is that fair to say? That, that primarily the, the library market is more focused on, or the, the more focused on com the comics that are aimed at all, all ages or, or YA audience? Um, I have ask this question a lot of many librarians, and I find that a lot of the librarians who have budgets to buy comics are youth services librarians, which is not necessarily, you know, a very wide representation of what the medium has to offer, because there are comics for all different ages, including um, adults, and Fanographics has a lot of comics that are um, aimed at senior age readers, um, which is another, you know, very, uh, big demographic of a lot of community libraries. Um, so we, Fanographics has fought 40 years to establish adult comics um, as art, and we're, we're still fighting that fight with librarians a little bit. Uh, it, it'll happen, but uh, yeah, a, a big part of the library market is, is for younger readers. But that doesn't mean that all comics are for young people. There are adult cool. comics that have lots of mature and, and, and more, uh, yeah, adult themes. Why do you think that's so? Why do you think right now it's primarily aimed at the young? It's because there's so much emphasis put on getting young elementary school age children to learn to read and to engage with literature at a younger age, whereas past a certain point, maybe we're not as a, as a culture as interested in that? I'm, I'm I critiquing think society. Here, that, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> I think that, that, I mean, if you look at the, just like people who spend more time reading, you have younger people who are trying to find their place in the world, and then you have older people who, you know, like again, like senior age people who, you know, might not necessarily be raising a family and working a full-time job. I think part of why it's harder to get a lot of adult readers in general, not just with comics, is because most adult people don't have as much free time. Um. I, no, go ahead. No, 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 Kathy, go first. Um, this statistic may be old, um, but at one point, the average age of a graphic novel reader was 27, which I found fascinating as a library administrator. And in our library, we uh, bought and collected and offered graphic novels for children, for teens and for adults. And we shelved them. We were very into merchandising our collection. So we shelved them separately to kind of focus attention for those different audiences in different parts of the library. And it was fascinating. It was just fascinating to me that it was such a broad range that uh, adults also didn't necessarily only read in the adult collection, but they would read in the young adult collection, depending on the, the nature of the material. So I think, it, I think in reality, it's much broader. I think very often the youth services librarians are those early champions of the format. And if the library is smart because uh, graphic novels have such a high turnover rate, there's such a, a, a strong readership for them, 
uh, that they will start collecting for adults as well? Um, so something that is of interest to me is um, to, the like I said before, the library sort of straddles this weird line between public library and academic library. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that we're sort of trying to help um, work with because I think more and more for academic libraries, comics are being seen as, you know, primary sources and as worth, worthy, quote unquote, <laughs> of, you know, research. And so, um, you know, there are more comic studies programs um, internationally than there are in the United States, but I think that that's changing. And so I think as you get to see um, academia sort of change its mind yeah. on comics as a format, there's probably going to be a little bit more shift in readership to a certain extent because those those people who are you know undergrads who get assigned a comic book as a part of their reading list then right. you know might be more likely to want to read them later into their 20s and their 30s and so you know i think mouse really changed that um you know and then it has changed later mouse is still i think one of the most frequently taught um graphic novels in like academics, but I think that that's changing, especially, you know, in the last five years when there have been so many more historical yeah. um, topics and um, nonfiction narratives and biography and autobiography coming out. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping that um, people will see the Library of Congress as a resource for doing that type of work to come and use our collections for that academic work, um, because that's kind of what we're there for. And then, you know, we'll get to collect the book that they publish later, along with the books that they read while they were writing their book, it becomes this very generative thing, which is something that I find very fascinating. But, you know, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> I should say that, yeah, university libraries are like, like, the, like, librarians at universities are my people. <laughs> we, um, that's like, I think one of our, our, the librarians we tend to work the closest with are people who, work in libraries, not only because a lot of our books are taught in, in universities, especially within the art program, um, but now we're, we are doing more nonfiction books just because there are more amazing nonfiction comics being made and, and, um, and uh, they are primary sources for a lot of research materials. Well, what are, the, what are some of the challenges you guys are, are facing or, or thinking about in terms of the relationship between comics and libraries for the future? Like, is, is it going to be a challenge to bring, to draw and more adult readers in? And and to, to should libraries be reaching more out more to, than they are to adult readers? Well, I think that that's, like, we're at a critical time um, for, for librarians, especially. Um, and another reason why I, I'm so excited about the Graphic Novel Roundtable, uh, which, uh, you know, I think that you mentioned earlier with ALA, because because there are so many youth services librarians who are offering really great kids and young adult material to, to younger readers, as those readers mature, they're gonna wanna continue reading comics. So, so this, is, this is the time, librarian friends in this room, to make sure that you, you keep your communities interested in comics as these people grow up. So when they're 19 and 20, they can find books that speak to them um, and then all the way through again um, to senior readers like like once you have the language for reading comics which is its own kind of thing it's not like reading um, a prose novel there's a language to reading comics once you have that in your brain it's like a bicycle you know how to do it mm -hmm. don't stop you got to keep on working those muscles and I, th I think it's a, a misnomer to think that libraries are focusing only on youth right. for uh, the format. Uh, mm. A lot of libraries have started, and for a long time, have been doing events that link comics in their communities, whether it's free comic book day or having local comic artists come and give programs at their library or doing comic cons at their library. And I've attended a lot of these, and it's not just kids that come out for those yes. kinds of programs. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of adult interest in that as well as kid interest. So, um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not just a 
kids and libraries are trying to attract adults. The adults are already there. Maybe that audience needs to be expanded or catered to more than they are right now in some libraries, uh, but they're there already. Yeah, yeah. So librarians, please cater to your adult comics readers. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see. Let's see if we have any uh, any uh, questions from the audience here. Anyone want ooh, to? Ooh. Uh, yeah, right there in the corner. seen our books? Come to W50. Uh. <laughs> We particular, like Panographics publishes and prints books based on the format that the art is delivered to us, um, almost always dictated by the artists themselves. I don't know if every publisher does that big, uh, like the New York publishing houses that focus more on, on trade. Um, so we really only publish at the size that the book was intended to be printed. Uh, and sometimes that means that the words are quite small. But maybe we should provide some magnifying glasses. <laughs> some of those old comic strip collections could probably use it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We Fantagraphics has a large archive of of classic comics from the fifties and thirties, forties, fifties, and sixties. Um, and we print as big as we're able to. <laughs> Rainy, is that, is that something you've experienced? Does Scholastic have any kind of rules as far as like making sure that it's legible, legible and <laughs> I don't know that they have specifically published large formats comics. I know that I get asked that question mm -hmm. frequently, though. So it's, it's something to look into. I think that, I mean, my, my books are printed like 8 by 5 or something like that, 8 point whatever. And uh, I try to make my font size big enough to be read. And I don't put that many words on a page, but like I'm, I'm thinking ahead. <laughs> to a small book format, that's true. a larger book format, and the artist is cramming a ton of information onto a page. Right. Sometimes that means writing smaller. Um, over there on the, yes, you. Hi, uh, thanks for the shout out to the zine librarians, hooray. Um, I d in the zine librarianship uh, conversations, we talk a lot about creators' rights. Uh, we talk a lot about how the differences between uh, independent publishing, such as zines or comics, and the difference between uh, that and, and traditional publishing. And some of the big differences there are that uh, independent publishing can also uh, be very, very personal and can also be thought of by the creator as ephemeral. And they may not be thinking about having them in libraries. So you've been talking a lot about getting them into libraries. Um, do you have, have people been having the conversation in, in comics about what happens when creators no longer want their, uh, want their works, their, their small press comics in libraries? Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to say no, probably. So th this is a little bit tricky. Um, there's actually been um, a discussion. There's been a few academic articles recently about like the right to be forgotten. Um, there's a better phraseology for that. Um, and I know that that's something that academic librarians are aware of, and that you know the Library of Congress certainly, if somebody asked us to. Um, you know, not serve their material, I don't, we would, um, you know, if they got in touch with us, we, that, I mean, they're, it's their right to ask it not to be made publicly available. Um, but I think that that's sort of hard for libraries because that's kind of the opposite of our mission <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a tricky question. It's one I've never actually heard or considered before, uh, so I don't want to, to venture an opinion, you know, apart from that, uh, that works have a life beyond 
the creator, the, like once they're in the world, they're in the world. Um, and it's hard to control that access once, once it's out. But it's an interesting question, and I'm sure one I'll refer to the graphic novels roundtable. Stumped us. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm being told that that's, uh, we have to wrap things up now. I apologize to those who had questions. But thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Let's give a round of applause, please. Thank you, Chris, for moderating the panel. Thank you. Thank you.